Hey, welcome to Real Life Guitars. I'm Sam, and uh, this video, short video, is um, kind of aimed at anybody who hasn't seen the inside of one of these before and might be interested in how it works and what it's made up of. And so, what I'm going to do in this video is take this thing, strip it down to pieces into its constituent parts, um, and, and show you what's in it. The reason I'm doing that is I'm not actually going to put this one together again. I want to um, use the neck on this one for another project. Um, so that's why I'm going to take it apart. But while we're doing it, we can see how things work um, and what's in there. Now, the first thing I want to do is just demonstrate to myself and to you whether it works or not. So I get my hand out, get a cable, lead, plug it in. This guitar is a very budget priced electric guitar. Great for beginners, not a lot of money tied up in it and people can just try it out and see whether or not they like the electric guitar and um, maybe learn on it and maybe actually use it and continue learning on it. Now, Old strings wouldn't be surprised if they break. So this electric guitar. Works. So everything in it is functioning, which is cool. Um, I paid about 40 quid for it in English monies and that's about I don't know how many dollars that is, 60 dollars something like that. Um, actually this isn't a bad one this is a very um, the Encore brand especially well most of the Encores are good actually they're, they're, they're not well respected because they're budget guitars and, and people kind of get tied up in buying big brand name things but actually these are really good quality necks and you know the electrics and everything play and work as they should and, and for not a lot of money you get a, a pretty good looking electric guitar to learn on. This body is very light, it's quite it's reasonably thick body, it's nicely shaped but it is very light, very light Chinese um, hardwood. The neck actually is pretty good quality and for what I'm going to use it for I'm going to cut it, reshape the headstock into a, a like a fender style one and I'm going to refret it and um, refinish it and so on to use in a, in a custom project and the custom project is this one over here made out of a nice single piece of ash so this is going to be a natural wood finished uh, hand carved mostly well I've routed the uh, cavities but that's going to be the new neck that belongs on here and uh, it's going to be a, a really sweet custom guitar for a customer called Mark Anyway, so I want to keep this video to kind of as short a time as possible. So let's just get on to taking it apart. And I'm going to possibly at some point refer to my whiteboard because I used to be a teacher once upon a time. Well, actually, I used to be a lecturer and I was always making kind of drawings on the whiteboard to kind of show how things work. And I tend to do that when I need to explain something. So I've got a whiteboard here and a nice pile of marker pens. So be prepared for the old the old lecturer mode to kick in occasionally. Going to get me some a couple of screwdriver bits out ready for taking the thing apart. Um, okay, so again, um, please ignore this if you have a guitar or you know how guitars work. This isn't a video for you. This is a video just for the casually interested person who may never have seen how this works. The first thing about this is. Um, the point to make is this is this is a great thing about guitars is electric guitars is they're mostly 1950s technology right that mean that means the middle of the previous century um, and not a lot has changed since then so this thing has nothing high tech in it at all and in fact there's nothing in it that can hurt you electrocute you do anything to you um, the reason it makes a noise is because some 
metal strings are anchored at one end and run over the top of a, a nut at the other end and of a certain length and they pass through the magnetic fields created by these little electronic or magnetic pickups down here and these things when you they don't need any positive wiring or positive current these things the way the magnets work is that when you move a, f a ferrous string in the magnetic field the movement of the string in and out of that field creates a tiny charge and that charge is picked up um, and amplified or sent to the amplifier via the circuitry here down through the cable to the amplifier and the amplifier amplifies that and that's uh, that's an amazing piece of te technology that hasn't changed since about 1940 possibly even earlier 30s maybe but it became popular in the 50s when Bender started making the sort of Stratocaster type guitar um, along of course Les Paul um, was making uh, well, the Les Paul came out a little bit earlier I think but the, the Fenders were the first kind of mass-produced guitars and so they made them from slabs of wood like this because uh, they were easy to make with a router um, and some basic tools and you could kind of manufacture them to a, a consistent standard if you had a template so I have uh, a template uh, or some templates that I was using yesterday for example um, Here's one. Here's one for the basic shape, okay. And then you've got others for the pickup cavities that you might want to use that work with the same shape. And so once you've got those templates made, you can make a standardised guitar time and time again, um, which is pretty cool if you're looking to manufacture them. So anyway, Fender made these things popular, and he made them in a very simple slab-like mass-produced way. And this is a you know, modern version of that, but made very cheaply in China. Uh, some people think the wood influences the tone that comes out of these pickups or comes out of the amplifier. And uh, I think it's a very, high, a very unlikely thing that it does. Um, think about it, the sound is made by strings moving in and out of a magnetic field creating a small current which is then amplified electronically by an amp which then comes out of the speaker. The role of the wood in that is mostly as a stable platform to hold the neck and the body together, in other words these two anchor points to allow the string to vibrate in a consistent way and more importantly to sustain. Okay, If these were this was made of expanding foam and this was made of jello then this wouldn't make that noise it would probably sound like more like that so think of the guitar don't get too romantic about the guitar it's a lot of style and and don't get me wrong it's a magical thing because rock and roll was made on this thing so the kind of the material peculiarities of the the guitar the fact that it's made of wood which doesn't behave the same all the way it's made of crude electronics which behave differently and sometimes sound differently especially around the pickups um, and it's played by a range of different people with different experiences and different techniques and different feelings and so on all of that creates the magic but the kind of underlying object is a is a pretty crude crude thing but it's great because of that so it's not mysterious but it is magical that's the way I like to think about it okay so let's take the thing apart all right and let's get doing it as quick as we can so first of all I'm going to take the strings off and then we're going to take the neck off. Sorry, I'm going to waggle you around a bit. So off come the strings. And what do I know? What do we know about guitar strings? Well, they're kind of coiled, wound strings. Three of them are wound, typically on a guitar like this. And three of them are plain steel. So the lower ones are wound. And kind of experience over the years and decades has shown that for the low notes, the wound strings are better. And then for the high notes, treble notes, the uh, plain steel strings, well, no, it's not really steel, it's ferrous. Actually, they're nickel, what are they? Copper, copper nickel, nickel steel, whatever they call them. Uh, I think it's, I've forgotten what the composition is now, but they're, they're ferrous because obviously they, they, um, they have to be in order to uh, make the pickups produce a current when you waggle these things. And that's the beauty. Of this it's physics all the way the 
The fact that the string produces a tone is because of the, I've forgotten the, I guess it's one of the basic electromagnetic principles, and that is if you move a, a ferrous object in and out of a magnetic field, it creates a current. But I think it only, I'm pretty certain it only does it um, at the point uh, as you move in and out, all right? So it doesn't, once you, if you just lay the string in the magnetic field and didn't move it, nothing would happen. Um, as you can tell, you can plug a guitar in and um, leave it plugged into the amp and don't hit the strings and nothing will happen. Unless, of course, you have the volume up really, really loud. In which case, the volume coming out of the speakers can make your, um, make your strings vibrate again and the whole, the whole process goes into a feedback loop. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the back cover off. Now, there's a back cover on this guitar to cover up a blemish. So wherever you see a... Wherever you see plastic on the guitar, you know it's covering something. And it's usually convenience, um, because it's easier to cover up than it is to try and find another way of doing the thing. Which is great, it's no problem at all. So the back plate on a Stratocaster style guitar covers the um, tremolo route, it's called. And this is where the bottom end of the bridge, where the strings fit, um, are anchored, and they're anchored to a unit with springs. And the idea about this, although this one has a tremolo arm broken off inside of here, so it probably I won't be able to demonstrate it very well. But if you had a tremolo arm, and if there wasn't a block of wood holding it down, you could basically use the tremolo arm. No, not very well. In fact, it is broken. But you could use your tremolo arm to raise the bridge up and down and make your strings make that nice wavering noise that you get. Hank Marvin used to use it a lot in the shadows in the, in the 1960s. It was a very characteristic tone and of course it was it was all big in those days particularly um, because it was you know a recent invention and Fender called this the synchronized tremolo or yeah he called it I think he called it a tremolo bridge but it's not really a tremolo, it's, it's a, one of the weird things. Wobbling this up and down with the so-called whammy bar is actually a vibrato system. All right, it makes the string go up and down in tone. A uh, pitch, sorry. Anyway, so it's, it's operated by the arm and it's kept in tension by these springs behind here, which we'll take out. And three kind of box standard springs but once you take out, then you don't get any, uh, you won't get any action from your vibrato unit. You can't make it um, go up and down. And this one moves a little bit because it's held in place by these six screws. And those six screws, their job, they're not done very well here, they're too tight. But their job is to hold the plate down and ideally when the springs are at the right tension and when you've got your arm in and there isn't one snapped off in there, you, your strings sit on there and you can bend it up and down a little bit to make it change the pitch of the note which gives it that nice shimmery effect. So having taken the springs off this already I'm going to remove the six tremolo screws which are really important critical part of this, this instrument really. I mean first of all they, they hold the bridge in place which holds your strings firmly at this end um, but they also serve that role of being allowing the bridge to move up and down. Now a lot of people on this kind of guitar and others as well, but wherever there's a, a tremolo style bridge, an awful lot of people will lock it in position like the previous owner of this one did by shoving a piece of wood in the back or sometimes screwing the screws all the way in so it just keeps it stiff. And then um, people like to do that because having this locked in place um, tends to stabilize the tuning. So when people have it moving and they have it in the kind of floating mode as it's called, um, what happens is it does the thing you might want it to do which is to change the pitch up and down of the notes for your style of playing. But in order to do that it basically has to allow the strings to move in and out of the slots that are cut into this nut at the end here. And usually they're badly cut. And so the strings, while they're supposed to move freely backwards and forwards in their stretching process, actually they don't, they get caught up in that. And that's what causes the detuning. 
And using this um, just exaggerates the problem that most people have got in the badly cut slot in this anchor point at the end called the nut. Um, so this bridge just flops out like that and then you're left with a slot, six screw holes for where the unit locks down or, or anchors and a slot that goes all the way through and uh, when it's in place as you can see and it's been used it goes like that and you can see that if it's if it's um, slackening and tightening, slackening, tightening on this side, it's tightening and slackening, tightening and slackening the springs on this side. So they work in opposition to each other. And when you have it set up right, the string pull, the loading of the strings and the pulling of the springs are set in a kind of in equilibrium. And you usually can get it to a place that's about like that. And then you can go some backwards to raise the pitch and you can go some forward to decrease the pitch and it gives you that nice effect. That's the bridge. On these cheap guitars, um, there isn't an awful lot of difference between a more expensive guitar that's got six saddles, you move them up and down with these little grub screws to get the height of the action, um, how it feels, how high the strings are above the fretboard is the most important bit. But what is big, a big difference is on these cheaper guitars, budget guitars, this is a, a cheap grade um, zinc alloy instead of steel. So on the more expensive guitars, the construction's pretty much the same, but this will be either a big brass block for stability and weight. And actually the argument is that increases sustain of the notes, but you know, some people don't even agree with that. So let's take the next bit off. The neck. It's held on with four chunky bolts or screws. They're not really bolts four screws like that so they're quite hefty and they go through the body here into the neck heel and they pull into this plate which absorbs some of the stress of the tension and these four come out pretty easily and when they do the neck is ready to drop off and that's what made this a fantastic thing in its day for Fender, Leo Fender who, who designed it and manufactured it because suddenly you could put things together easily um, and you could make a thousand of these and a thousand of these, a thousand of those scratch plates, three thousand of those pickups, three thousand knobs, a thousand switches and so on and you just put this thing together really quick and you can see that if I've got a template to hand as I have I could in my machine shop I could route route out this shape without too much thinking and I could get the manufactured neck made to the right spec and I could sorry sawdust and I could just go bam fit it in not a lot of wiggle put the screws in nice and secure and I'm on my way to making a guitar so that's a pretty cool thing to have invented in the 50s um, and it led you know to the I guess it led to the boom of rock and roll that's where it came from these things that are rattling here those are the strap screws typically they would hang the strap when you're playing it um, because they because they get kind of a lot of stress on them they tend to wear out eventually um, you end up either having to put something else in the hole with the strap screw to kind of bu um, bulk it out or some resin or something to stop it moving or you can find a larger scale, a larger gauge screw all together and that will do the job. It will bite some fresh wood. But you can see just a screw hole into wood and somebody's cracked the paint there as well as they've done it. Okay, so we're now into the last bits. These are the pick guard screws. Their job, little, little neat little screws, their job is only to hold the pick guard onto the face of the guitar. And as you can see, the, the electronic stuff, the brains of the guitar, if there is any, all hang from this plastic sheet, which is why it's such a clever invention. Um, I quite often make guitars where there isn't one of these and the electronics either sit in, um, are, are screwed in, into obviously cavities, but they're fixed to the guitar body. The pit guard allows you to hang it, which is much easier to control. Um, it gives you a lot of adjustment room as well, whereas when you mount things to the body of the guitar, it's harder to adjust them. It can look really cool, but... Hey, 
How long have we been going? I don't want this to be too long. Hey, 19 minutes. Come on, we can do it. So, out come all the pit guard screws. And when we lift this up, you can see it moves. And up we come. And we've got a, well, that's already broken off. That's cool. We've got some plectrums. Hey, hey. It's like a secret gift. Thank you. Um, we've got some plectrums. Now, you'll notice some bits of flaky paint routed out quite crudely routed um, cavities here we'll look at those closer in a minute but we've got all of the bit that makes the guitar play hangs from the plastic um, in a single unit so you can change those out you can put new pickups in of your choice you can change the, the potentiometers these three things you can change the switch you can do lots of variations all hanging off that plate and all the things you might buy as in, as upgrades tend to fit, so you don't have any real problem just lowering them into there. Now, this is the jack socket, and I'm just going to snip it off for now, rather than solder it. Normally I'd take it off. This is designed so that the jack socket goes into it like that, it's sitting in the body that way. And it's a really great way of fitting the jack socket in, in a way that, um, puts the least amount of stress on this little nut and thing because basically it's a very simple thing under there. The, con uh, the jack itself has a positive, the end bit is positive, that bit's earth and uh, it comes through into here. Positive touches on the tip here which goes to positive into the, it's the, it's the hot signal if you like into the wiring and the, um, the, the lower part of it, this bit here, the earth, touches uh, the the, sh the sort of um, the sheath here or the tube so you've got a hot uh, a hot lug there with the wiring going to hot and you've got a ground lug that goes to ground and that allows you to um, that's where the signal goes out of your guitar but it's also where the if you like the earth grounding comes into your guitar to make sure it's all grounded so a very simple thing but a great design Be better than the ones that you might find on, the, on an SG which sticks out of a jack uh, jack socket that basically this un does this undo? No, not very easily. Um, on an SG, you can often find that the the jack socket is in a thin piece of wood here, it sticks right up, and it gets pulled and pushed as you play, and then eventually splits the wood here, which isn't so great. This wire is the signal that comes out of the volume pot after it's come through to the switch, through to the tone controls, and then finally out of the volume pot and the volume kind of is where you control the output signal to the amp and it comes through here connects to the jack plug there and goes down through the cable to the amp so that's the kind of really important one the other wires are just the wires from the pickups to the different switching options and then some jumper wires to give you some tone controls but with pretty much everything done we are just going to take out what's called the tremolo claw and the tremolo claw is these two big screws that hold the claw that holds the springs in place. And the claw is a really important part of it. It's, again, it's a very crude thing, but being able to screw the claw in and out using these screws allows you to increase or decrease the tension on the, on the uh, bridge, on the springs, I should say, that hold the bridge in place. And this ability to do that is really critical when you come to set the tremolo up in a floating mode which means you have some backward movement when you pull back on the arm and you have some downward movement and how much in in the backward or the pitch increase direction is dictated by where you set that and there's a way of doing it which I won't go into in this video so here is our cheap Chinese wooden um, it's actually solid wood, it's not. Some in the old days, some of these would have been made in plywood, but this is solid timber. It's light as anything, a bit too light for my liking. But you can see that with their templates, they route out this, they route out these three shapes here to accommodate these three single coil magnetic pickups. Then it, room for the switches and the pots to fit in here without hitting anything. And then room to sink the jack plug into there so that you can connect your guitar to the amp. Bridge slots in there, as we've seen, and, that, and moves up and down. 
in the back there's room for the bridge um, block to move and then there's the spring space which is critical to holding that bridge in equilibrium with the string pull. So that is the complexity of your electric guitar and it, the Strat is so beautiful because it has a belly carve here which for everybody allows your rib cage basically to sit in there or your man boobs or whatever it is you got depending on how old you are. Um, but it is, it's what makes the Strat a gorgeous shape. Then there's a forearm slope here which is really important so that your, your arm when playing doesn't feel the edge of the thing. To aid that all the edges are nicely rounded too which is a nice aspect of the Strat. Is what makes it such a, del a delightful guitar. So what we've got here, I'm not going to take these individual things into pieces, I'll, I'll store this as it is because I might well use it just like that. So we've got the typical Strat pick guard shape, we've got three single coil pickups in here. Um, they, all they are is three metal or steel, no, ferrous, iron you could call it, no I suppose, ferrous whatever, ferrous, iron um, pole pieces. They're not magnetic of themselves but they all are magnetized by a, a um, ceramic magnet sitting here and that's been magnetized. So each of these pickups magnetizes the, um, the poles by the fact they're sitting and touching the bottom of the poles. What you can't see is around all of that, or around the poles, is a tightly um, wound uh, coil of wire, copper, very fine copper wire. And so you've got metal mag magnetized poles sitting surrounded by a, mag uh, a coil of wire. And that's the principle um, that sets up the production of an electric charge. So when a string moves through the magnetic field set up by this pole, courtesy of that ceramic magnet, it creates a voltage in the coil surrounding it, which then goes down the wire to the switch. You can choose between combinations of those single coils. So we've got neck one on its own, neck and middle together, middle on its own, middle and bridge one together, and bridge one on its own. You can select your combination, which ones you want to be producing the little voltage, and then you can um, choose the tone controls, which usually apply to only those two. And then you can set the overall volume that you want out of that. And that comes out of there, goes to your amplifier and makes a great, great sound. And as you can probably guess, the most of the tone comes from how you feel, what day it is, something about the pickups, what kind of player you are, what kind of amp you've got, what kind of pedals you use, what the room's like that you're playing in, what the temperature are like in the hall that you're playing in, and so on and so on. There are so many variations that make tone. Now, for the last few minutes of this video, we're going to get onto the, what, in a way, what's the, some people think this is the heart of the guitar, right? This is just a shell. This just, this makes the thing it looks sexy, it looks like rock and roll, feels nice, whatever, but it doesn't really do much. You could make that into a plank as Les Paul did in the late 50s um, and it would still play. Some people think this is the heart of the guitar and to be fair having good pickups can produce a really great tone noticeable from cheap pickups. But my feeling is the heart of the guitar lies in this thing that you interact with all the way and that's why I like to spend most of my attention when I'm um, upcycling or, or um, creating a custom guitar, I like to re reuse and upcycle old necks. Partly because uh, the construction work's done, right? So I don't need to sort of worry too much about um, you know, making strips of timber, putting a truss rod into them, I'll tell you what that is in a minute, and doing all the clever cutting and exact woodworking things. If I get hold of a decent quality basic start point, I know that since it was made, it hasn't twisted or warped, so I know the wood's stable. I know that I can rework it to whatever shape and look I want, and I can also refret it to whatever um, feel I want, and, and whatever radius I want too. And the radius is the amount of curvature of the fingerboard in this direction. Right? So some old classic guitars have a very tight radii, like that, like a 7.5 inch. So you imagine a circle of a diameter of 7. Point, is it radius? No, yeah, sorry, the radius is 7.5 inch, of course, um, which is a diameter of 15 inches. Um, the bigger the number, the flatter the curve, meaning the bigger the circle that it's part of. So um, this 
uh, a lot of the vintage strats would have a 7.25 radius. Um, some of the more modern strats, 9.5 radius. Um, this modern Chinese copy is probably more like a 16 inch radius, which is what um, Mark actually wants. So I'm going to re-radius the shape to 16 if it isn't already, but in doing so I'll clean off all the old gunge, finger marks, any dimples, dents and whatever, and we'll bring out the beautiful colour of this rosewood. Also on this budget copy, you, it's a nice chunk of rosewood you can see, but it's a little sharp on the edge here, so I'm going to round off some of the edges as I go. So what I'm taking off right now, in our short time, are the tuners. And these devices, as you probably saw at the beginning, oops, there's one falling out, um, allow you to tighten up and slacken off the strings. So they are, they do what their name suggests. They hold the string firm at one end, but they allow you to adjust. So they have a little gearing unit inside, plus two little gears, um, and that's how you tighten and loosen the string. Um, some people think tuners are responsible for the tuning stability of the guitar. Well, they're not. In my experience of setting up well over a thousand, probably 1,500 or more guitars in the last few years, tuning stability is about two principal things. First of all, it's about the condition of the nut slots here. As I mentioned earlier about the tremolo putting the thing out of tune, if these grip the strings in any way as they're running through them, then you will have total tuning and stability no matter what you do. No matter how expensive tuners you put on, you'll still never get it to stay. You'll get it into tune and the tuners may look great and they may feel lovely to operate, but it, because these strings, the strings are getting caught in the tight pinch points here, as soon as you bend a, a note or something, it'll go out of tune and you'll be tearing your hair out. So 50% of the tuning stability is in the nut slots here and the other 50%, believe it or not, is in the residual slack which is in your strings once you put them onto the complete guitar. And there's a ton of it in there and if you don't stretch it out at the beginning and I, I do it in a process that really pushes and pulls with all my fingers and quite a lot of force if you don't stretch all that slack out it will eke its way out through the process of slight detuning for a year or two years after you've strung it um, it'll it'll go on and on and on and drive you mad so two points nut slots condition of and the unreleased slack in your strings. I take about 15 to 20 minutes to stretch it all out before I put a guitar on a peg and call it ready to play or ready to send back to a customer. Okay, so here we have the basic heart of it, right? It's it's down to how this plays and how it feels, okay? Because this is what you interact with. Whether you like a, a rounded radius or a flat radius is down to personal preference um, and, and that's either good or bad, whichever one you prefer. The shape of the headstock doesn't make any difference. Um, it's, it's really a style thing. This is styled this way because it's Encore's way, or John Hornby Skews who makes this. It's their way of staying clear of Fender's trademark problems. Um, it's it's near enough like a Strat, not to, but different enough not to run into copyright or trademark problems. So, this is, the, I think, the heart of the guitar, and to get it to play right, you've got to get the feel of the, oh, you, you've got to get the frets in good condition. So they've got to be good frets. I've got a set here hanging up, ready to go on this guitar when I've taken the old ones out. And if you can see, hey, I haven't used the whiteboard. Amazing. Um, I'm going to put those frets in here, even though these are fairly good condition, but I want them new and, and chunky. So I'm going to take all these out, and then I'm going to sand the fingerboard, bring it back to a nice clean new looking finish. I'm going to ditch this plastic nut, put a bone one in, and then I'm going to um, re-radius if I need to, to shape the, the fingerboard the way I want, and also round off these edges. Then I'll refret it, and then I'm going to refinish it, because um, I'll, I'll, I'll do a different shape on here. I'll get rid of the Encore, and I'll put my own logo on it when I'm finished. So I've put a lot of time into this, because I think this is the, the bit that you really get intimate with on a guitar. This stuff either performs well or it doesn't. It kind of does, it's physics at work here. This has personality and this is what you get used to and this is what you tend to um, fall in love with on a guitar. It's the way it feels to play. Um, and also added by this critical factor is does it stay in tune? You, you'd be amazed if you think about guitars or if you haven't, if you're new to it, you'll find over your time playing guitars that the ones you keep 
getting down off the peg are the ones that stay in tune because this happens to be right and there happens to be no slack in the system. All right. So I'm going to take this off the hook a minute, see if we've got any charge in here. Yay! Unplug you from the mains. So just looking at what we got left at the end of this, we got the block that held it locked so the person didn't use the tremolo bridge in a rocking fashion. We've got the bridge itself, we've got the tremolo screws, we've got the tremolo claw and there are two screws, sorry, tremolo springs, the tremolo claw and it's two screws, we've got the five tremolo screws that held the tremolo on the front of the guitar, like that. We've got the jack socket which neatly angles the jack and keeps it in a nice little pocket on the front. We've got the tuners that allow you to tighten up and untighten the strings. We've got the strap buttons. We've got the neck joint, uh, the neck plate that holds, pulls the neck heel into the body. We've got a load of pick guard screws. We've got the back plate with some holes to allow you to restring it without taking this off if you want to. And then we've got the pick guard loaded with, these are Guitar Tech. That's, that's Encore's own brand and they aren't bad actually. You know, you can have fun playing those. We've got the neck, simple construction, maple, single piece of maple here, all right, a piece of chunky rosewood glued to the top, but underneath there's a routed channel, and in there there's a what's called a truss rod, and that truss rod, the purpose is to control how much the neck curves. This is wood, when you put a load of strings pulling in that way, it tends to bend it into a curve, and what you do is you get your Get your hex key of one kind or another, Allen key in the UK, and you use it to, it's not a very good one on this one, use it to adjust the metal truss rod in your neck. So let's say, for example, you've got your strings on and you're using a heavy gauge of strings and it's pulling a great big curve into the neck. And when you play it, because it's curved, if the action up here feels really high and it feels like you have to press down for miles. Well, you can flatten that out somewhat by using your hex key and you use the hex key to either uh, tighten up or slack off the, um, the truss rod in here. If I want to counteract a lot of curvature in the neck, I will flatten it by tightening it up and I go in the clockwise direction if I actually get my hex key in there. Right, it starts to tighten. And tightening it, you'll actually be able to see the effect of it because I can feel it biting now and it's stiffening up. As I turn it and look down the neck, the more I tighten it, the more of a curve in this direction it will go. If I have uh, put the strings on and the, the neck is too flat or it's even got a hump, then I need to release the pressure on the truss rod and allow the strings to pull the neck more into a curve. So I slacken the truss rod off and I watch the neck go into more of a curve. And playing action and the way that it feels has a lot to do with those adjustments there as well. A lot of people are frightened of the truss rod and adjusting it. Um, it, the best thing you can possibly do if you have a guitar like this, cheap or expensive, is make the adjustment yourself and see what it does to the neck. That's the only way you're really going to get an understanding of it. I've just explained it very quickly there, but you can find out yourself. And once you know, you'll be making adjustments to suit your own style. There is no, as with the all of these things, with the playing action and the way this neck is set up to work with the rest of the components on this, the strings, the bridge, there's no hard and fast rule what there is, is a set of preferences and some start points. Um, you can set it with very high action at the nut, which feels hard to play, very high action down at the end, which makes the strings hard to push down here. But some people really like that because they have big heavy strings and they hit the power cords really hard and it suits them. Some people much prefer low action and to be able to bend and tap and things, and they tend to have a flatter neck lower action at both ends, nut and bridge, and then much lower action. Now for a lower action you need the frets to be more level. You can get away with uneven frets on a, with a higher action. Make no mistakes, even from a factory these frets all come slightly uneven because the process that they're hammered in with is pretty crude and, and it never gets it exactly right. So there you go, there are the components of your electric guitar. And you can see that when Leo Fender kind of came up with this idea in the 1950s. He had a group, it's such a great idea to make a, a mass produced guitar style of guitar. This wasn't the first, he made a Telecaster first, which was even simpler than this, really. But
but you could see that his idea was to take musical instruments away from the sort of complex carved organic structures of, of you know the orchestra style instruments into more slab like you know plank of slab slab of wood um, you know an easily mass produced neck and then a bolted connection which made the thing so much simpler and of course purists hated the thought of it um, because it, it was too utilitarian but it's proved incredibly successful some people have a, a view on bolt-on necks and they think they're really crap but they've done really well for fenders throughout their history and through the history of rock and roll so can't complain anyway there you have the components and what makes your electric guitar and what makes it work as well it's not mysterious it's it's a few basic principles of physics that make this produce electric current which produces a tone your amplifier translates that into a noise basically here it's just an electric signal electric current small current the amplifier is what makes it make a sound with a speaker and some effects and so on um, the principles by which this neck relates to the body and the strings relate to the bridge and how they make make this make uh, electrical current those are all pretty much exactly the same no matter what type of guitar electric guitar you're talking about i think the last thing i want to say on this so-called short video oh we're on 41 um, a lot of manufacturers would like to tell you that their particular guitar is unique and needs special attention and and almost would ha be happy for you to believe that uh, the kind of alternative laws of physics apply to their particular guitar and it isn't the case if you can learn the basics required to set this 40 pounds guitar up and I bl believe you trust me this thing will play beautifully it's got there's nothing here that won't play like a dream if you put the time into just getting it right following a few basic principles those few basic principles about um, setting the neck right about leveling the frets so that they're even about getting the nut slots right and about getting the, str the slack out of your strings and so on those few basic things that I do on every setup they apply to 99% of the weird and wonderful electric guitars you'll see, whether it's a Les Paul, a Flying V, a double neck thing, a 12 string, you know, yeah, no matter how exotic it is, whether it's a 1,500 pound Fender Custom Shop or it's a 40 pound Encore Blaster beginner's guitar, those principles are the same because they all work the same. They've got frets, they've got a nut anchor at this end, they've got a bridge anchor at that end, that creates a, a playing length which these frets are divided up in the correct intervals and that then goes over some poles on a, on a series of pickups which create a small charge which your guitar sends to the amp and the amp turns into a tone in conjunction with what you're doing with your fingers and that is it there's no more mystery than that and you can see it is it, it is 1950s american technology a router some solder and some potentiometers that you might have built into a, a 1940s radio and that's where it came from this is primitive technology but as you know it's turned out brilliantly over the history of rock and roll so i hope that was interesting that's as quick as i can make it 40 minutes this neck is going to get defretted now this is going to get hung up and stored as with all these parts in a little container marked encore strap well that won't fit in a little container but you know what i mean and you'll see this again when it is well for the first time we can let me, let me show you a, a really critical moment mark's custom ash stratocaster i'd like you to say hello to your new donor neck dun, 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 dun. look at that you saw it here on camera the meeting the mating the meeting of these two components they are going to be one unit from here on look how beautiful that is Okay, these are going to fit together and this is going to be smoothed off and then you're going to have four big bolts here holding this in place, different kind of fitting. But that's the basic connection of the two things and they fit together. That's going to be the new neck for this guitar. How about that? That was the first moment, the birth of the guitar. All right, thanks for watching. Um, you can watch any of my other videos for more complex setups, but every video pretty much shows you everything I do each time. It's kind of repetitive, but it's um it's not really there to be entertaining it's there to show people what i did on their guitar at any one time so i hope you enjoyed it see you again soon thanks for watching